I want you guys to stay standing. I want to I wanna just speak a blessing over you and a declaration. Come on, put your hands towards heaven. Father, right now in Jesus' name, I pray over every person in this room, and I just declare a new season of raising your voice. I declare a new season of raising your voice. Come on, I declare a new season of raising your voice, and no longer will you be afraid to speak the gospel. No longer will you be afraid to speak up in the face of tyranny. No longer will you be afraid of confrontation. Come on, God is releasing a voice today, and I just declare that over this 10 o'clock service right now. Come on, in the mighty and precious precious name of Jesus Christ. Come on, if you believe that, you better shout at Jesus, the biggest amen he has ever seen. Come on. Well, welcome to City Point. You guys may take your seats. My name is Pastor Rick. I'm the executive pastor. Like Brittany said, we love the new people, man. We love everybody, but man, new people for, for joining us today. You guys are awesome. I want to welcome everybody online uh, watching. But turn with me to Esther chapter 4. Esther chapter 4, we're going to read verse 14 through 17, and for time's sake, I'm just going to paraphrase and just catch you guys up to what's going on. So Israel, they are in captivity in Persia, and uh, they are under King Xerxes, and uh, Xerxes hired a man by the name of Haman. Now Haman is second in command in the kingdom, and Haman hates the Jews. Uh, in fact, he loathes the Jews, and he wants to kill the Jews, and so he whips up a plan, uh, brings it to the king, and gets the king to sign off on this plan for him to basically eradicate all the Jews in the kingdom. And Mordecai, who is a Jew, uh, hears about this situation. And so he tells his niece Esther, who is actually a queen uh, under King Xerxes, who is also actually a Jew, about the plan that is about to unfold. And Esther's like, I have to do something about it. Uh, we got to do something. We cannot just stand by idly and allow this thing to happen to our people. And so she's talking to Mordecai through a eunuch uh, back and forth. And that's where we're going to pick it up here in verse 14, that they're having this conversation about what they should do to get in front of the king to tell him about this plan to eradicate the Jews. And so Mordecai sends word back to Esther in verse 14. He says this to Esther. He says, for if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your family's household will perish. He's saying, yeah, if you keep silent at this time, you have a choice. You can keep silent and just let this thing happen. You're going to die, but God will raise up somebody else. But then he says this. Notice this. He says, and who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. I love that. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go and gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf. Do not eat and do not drink for three days, night or day. And I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. You guys, it was against the law for anybody to do this. And in fact, if she went in front of the king and he didn't delight in her, he could have her killed right there on the spot. And then she says this. She says, and if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. You guys, the, the title of this message this morning is Raise Your Voice. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for every person in this room. God, I thank you for this message. Holy Spirit, I need you in this moment. God, I need you to, to, to help me out here, Holy Spirit. This is your word. This is your message. Lord, anoint me, Father, right now. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Come on, and everybody said amen. amen. Well, I was in a prison in 2009 down in Colorado Springs. You guys are going to hear a lot of prison stories today. I hope that's okay. You get the prison, Rick. I just love the new people. The look on your face right now is like, did he just say prison? Yes, I did. <laughs> so 2009, I was in a prison down in Colorado Springs. It was called Cheyenne Mountain Reentry Program. Now, this was a prison that they were sending prisoners to to try to get this private thing up and going. It wasn't a program at the time. In fact, it was more like gladiator school. Uh, we had 12-man cells in this prison, and it was fight club every single day and they were making alcohol and it was just one of the worst prisons that I've ever been to but God was alive in that prison I'm telling you I learned how to minister in that prison like never before well we were in this room uh, and this this woman uh, one of the one of the counselors there was trying to get this class up, up and going and so she was trying to just do anything she could to get the prisoners to talk and there was about 30 of us in there and it was about you know uh, young and old I mean guys that were rapists drug addicts, murderers. I mean, this room was full of just some of the worst of the worst. And she goes, okay, I'm going to draw an island on the, on the whiteboard. So she drew an island. And she says, uh, if this was your island, what would you want on your island? 
And I thought, man, you are a dumb lady asking a room full of prisoners what they would want on their island. And so all of a sudden, one guy says, I'd want all the drugs in the world on the island. And another guy's like, I want every girl in the world on the island. And another guy's like, man, just drink, man. I want some alcohol and all that. And it went so on like this for, you know, a little bit of time. And everything inside me was cringing. Have you ever been there where you're like, man, I need to say something, but I just don't want to because I'm afraid. It was just cringing on the inside of me. And I was struggling. I was wrestling within myself to go, man, should I say something? Should I? I mean, I'm like, man, I don't want to. Let me just let me just be apathetic. Just let them have their way. I just want to get through this class and get out of there. But no, I had to do something. And so I spoke up and I said, well, that's not what I would want on my island. And it was like dead silent. And all of a sudden, like 30 heads just went right towards me. And I'm like, oh, God. Here we go. You know, my heart's like pounding real fast. I'm like, geez, Lord, what do I do? And, uh, and then she goes, well, okay, Skadden, what would you want on your island? And I said, and I, and I just boldly said this. I said, you guys, everything, everybody's named here is what got us in here in the first place. I said, my island, I want love on my island. I want joy. When's the last time you guys had joy in your life? I want peace. I want Jesus. I mean, you know, I went on a, a whole list of things, and all of a sudden, slowly but surely, one by one, every single guy in that room uh, began to change his mind. You're like, yeah, no, this is what we want. They went up there, and they started erasing the board of different things. Man, I want my kids on that island, and I want my wife, and so on and so forth. And I cannot tell you, but something happened in the atmosphere in that room when I began to declare truth, when I began to speak light, when I began to speak life in the midst of darkness, all of a sudden the darkness in that room had to flee. It had to go somewhere else because somebody was bringing a word for the season. Somebody was bringing a word for that time. But can I just tell you that God has given every single one of you in here a voice? that he's given you a voice. He's given you a voice to speak life. He's given you a voice to speak light. He's given you a voice to speak in this dark age that we are living in. And I think it's time for Christians to start to use their voice in boldness. I think it's time for you to start to use your voice in courage. I think it's time to use your voice to start to silence the enemy instead of him silencing you. You have a voice. You and I have a responsibility in this hour, not tomorrow, not yesterday, but in this hour, we have a responsibility to use the voice, your voice, in your generation. You are alive for such a time as this that God has ordained you to be alive right now in this hour with what's going on in this season. He has ordained that to be so. And so with that in, in our mouth, how much more do we need to be a mouthpiece to a lost and dying world? world. Come on, we're not going to let a generation die off. We're going to be a voice. We're not going to let this world pass us by. We're going to be a voice. We're not going to lay down and be apathetic any longer. You're going to be a voice crying out in the darkness. Well, what's the problem, Pastor Rick? The problem is that too many Christians have been silenced by the enemy. The enemy has silenced you, maybe through circumstances, through things in your life, Maybe he silenced you through the woke agendas and the policies right now that's being implemented in our land. He might have silenced you that way. And what we've done is we've taken Matthew 5, 39, you know, the, the scripture about turning the other cheek, and we've taken that to interpret that to lay down, be soft, and let people run over us. But that's not what that scripture is for. It's not saying, Christian, you just need to be, just lay down, just be soft, just let him hit you on the cheek, and just, just roll over, just play dead, just let it pass you by. No, that scripture wasn't meant to let us be apathetic. That scripture was basically a commandment to not return insult for insult. That's what that is for. We were never meant to be soft. Meekness does not mean weakness, you guys. Meekness means controlled strength. That's who we are. We have the power of the Almighty God living on the inside of us. We are not a weak body. You are not a weak Christian. You are not a weak person. You're not called to lay down and be soft. Let me just say this. We're moving into a season in 2024 where you're going to have to raise your voice. You're going to have to raise your voice. You just are. You're going to have to raise your voice. It's the year of the pressing. This is going to be the year of Gethsemane. It's going to be the year of the pressing where it's going to require us to speak up that there's things that you cannot attain in the spirit by staying silent, that there's a contending that's going to have to happen in your, in your prayer closet. There's a contending that's going to have to happen behind the scenes, and that comes as you raise your voice. That comes as you lift up your voice. Uh, you see, God, he's looking for voices in this season, in this hour. He's looking for somebody. Will you be the voice? Christian, I'm talking to you in your seat. Will you be the voice in this generation, almost like a John the Baptist crying out, prepare the way of the Lord. Will you be his mouthpiece to call people back to righteousness. 
You see, I believe just like in Amos 7, 7, that God is restoring the plumb line back to, his, back to the world. That he's setting up a plumb line of righteousness and he's saying, this is the standard. This is the standard. This world has gone mad. It has gone chaotic, but I'm restoring the plumb line back to my people. He's looking for voices to call people back to righteousness. And will you allow him to fill your mouth with a word to be released? I believe there's a word that you need to speak over your business. There's a word you need to speak over your marriage. There's a word you need to speak over your kids. There's a word you need to begin to speak over your finances, that there's a word that God wants to put in your mouth that you need to begin to declare, you need to begin to speak, and you need to begin to speak it with boldness, almost as if you believe what you're saying, you guys. I'm telling you. So there's power in your voice. There's power when we speak. Just think when God created the heavens and the earth, he spoke and it came into being. And guess what? We are still living and stuff is still creating. Stuff is still regenerating and still renewing today because of that one word he spoke way back then. Right? Universe. One verse. Proverbs 18.21 says this. says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat of its fruit. Jesus tells us in Matthew 12.36 that on judgment day... You will give an account for every careless word that you speak. He says, for by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. And so there's power in our words. We have the power to create life. When we speak, we have the power to create death. When we speak, there is power to shape your future from the words of your mouth or the future of those around you for the better or for the good. Come on, somebody needs to quit speaking death over your life in here right now. I'm here to tell you right now, you've been speaking too too much death over your life. It's time to start speaking life. And again, this isn't a name it, claim it gospel message. This is the truth of God's word that your words create worlds. Your words create worlds. And when we speak, things happen. Proverbs 25, 11 says, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in setting of silver. And that word fitly in the Hebrew means at the proper time. I love that, at just the right time. Come on, who needs a fitly word in here today? Who needs a fitly word spoken over their life today? I remember a fitly word that was spoken over me uh, back in the vineyard in my old church. My pastor Rick O, any Rick Olmstead fans in here? Um, we have a few hands going up. Come on, you guys. Uh, you know, I had just gotten out of prison, and, uh, you know, I was kind of dabbling in sin a little bit. I, you know, I was freshly released, had one foot in the world, one foot in the kingdom. I was on my own for the first time in, you know, five and a half years, and it was just, you know, I was just kind of in this phase of backsliding. And I, I remember getting called out by God. I went to the back of the room, and, and Rick's like, what do you want? And I'm like, I don't want you to pray over me. And he goes, what do you want me to pray? And I said, just speak a word. I just need a word. And so he put his hand on me for about five minutes. It was silent. And then he goes, and he says this, and he didn't know a lick of what I was going through. He said, Rick, I really feel like God wants me to tell you that he did not let you out of prison for you to live your life the way you're living it right now. That you're doing some things you're not supposed to. It's time to stop and get back on track. You know, paraphrase there at the end. And I cannot tell you what that word did. It was a fitly word. It was a word spoken in due season. It was a word, it was what I needed to hear right in that moment. And it got me back on track. And I'm standing on this platform today because of that word that was spoken over me 10 plus years ago. Okay, so our words have power, right? They have power, a fitly word. And so how do we do this thing? Well, point number one is this. In order to raise our voice, we need to understand the times that we are living in. It's imperative that you understand the times that you're living in. Do not let this world pass you by. Do not allow and let the things going on in our society to just be apathetic and roll over and let it go by you. Look at verse 14. Again, he says this to her. He says, for if you keep silent at this time, Christian, I'm here to tell you, if we keep silent at this time, In this day and age, it is going to get worse and worse and worse. We cannot keep silent. He says, for uh, deliverance will rise from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. You see, we need men and women who understand the times that we are living in, who stand up and serve the purpose of God in their generation. You cannot serve the purpose of God in another generation. This is it. I'm sorry, you guys. This is it. This is your generation right here, right now. And we need men and women who understand the signs of the times and who serve that purpose. So what does the signs of our time look like? Well, we live in a world right now where truth is relative, where it's progressive, and where it's postmodern. It is what you make it, right? Our society is moving away from the moral compass of biblical morality. 
the plumb line has gotten off track. What was considered wrong a few decades ago is now fashionable and is now a human right. We live in a time where common sense is rare and reality is basically what you make it. Postmodernism says that there is no truth, that truth is man-made. And, 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 and so therefore we can make up our own truth and your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth and don't put your truth on my truth because I don't believe your truth and you don't have to listen to my truth but my truth is right because it's my truth. Somebody who is colorblind, okay, maybe their truth is they can't see red, it's gray. But the truth is that it's actually red. Am I right? And so this is postmodern world that we live in and the dangers of this is that when you start to instill your own moral compass... You can distort the truth for whatever you want it to be. When we're born, we're born into sin, right? A little the- theolo- theologicalness here is when we're born, we're born with a sin nature. That means you are bent towards sin. That means everything inside of you wants to sin. It, it is completely turned off to the things of God. But when you accept Jesus and you get the Holy Spirit, you are regenerative and you are now bent towards him. But we still have a sin nature that we deal with on, uh, you know, on a daily basis, right? And so everything inside of me, if it's bent towards sin and I start to make up my own truth, what kind of truth is that going to be? It's what you see going on in our world around us right now. And here's the other thing. If you get enough people to believe you, then all of a sudden it becomes a social norm. And people begin to accept it as their truth. Which is what we're seeing with the LGBTQ and the transgenderism movement right now. I mean, we thought we were going to have flying cars by now, but we can't even define a woman. Am I right? (laughs) Back to the future, man. They had, the, they had the skateboard, dude. That was hoverboard, man. That thing was sweet. I'm like, you know what? That's coming in the future, and I'm going to have one, and we're going to fly cars. Well, we got people that can't even define a woman. You know why? It's because they've made up their own truth. And what's true for them is not true for you. But if we steer away from the biblical moral compass that we have right here, we're, we're left to our own demise, and we're left to whatever truth we want to make up. Did you know there's actually parents out there who demand accommodation from schools because their son or daughter identifies as a cat or a dog? Do you know what a coward is? A coward is somebody who lets their son or daughter identify as a cat or a dog. That's a coward. And it's also child abuse. This is the world that we live in. Well, that's their truth. Who cares if that's their truth? You're the parent. Tell them what the truth is, right? I mean, our own Thompson School District They allow biological males in women's restrooms and vice versa right now. That's the reality of what we're living in, you guys, in our own community. I mean, in this last election, in our, you know, both our city council and Topton School Board, we actually lost some some conservative seats in both those those boards. You say, well, what's wrong with that, Pastor Rick? And I want to tell you what's wrong with that, because when I hold the moral plumb line of God's word, and I walk with this moral plumb line, and I got people on the Thompson School Board District who want to implement guys and girls' bathrooms and girls and guys' bathrooms. It doesn't quite line up to the plumb line of God's word, you guys. It doesn't quite line up to biblical morality. And we need to be a people who hold this thing, not as a Bible thumper, but as a speaker of truth to say, you know what, that doesn't quite line up. That's, that's not, that doesn't quite line up to what it says. Killing babies does not quite line up to what it says, right? We need to hold the moral compass of God's word up. That is what's wrong with liberalism. Conservatism has their own things too. That's why we need to be biblically political, right? This is our moral compass. And so the culture does not get to dictate truth. It's God's word that gets to dictate truth, right? Again, this is our paradigm that we view the world through. This is, this is how we view the world through. And we need this. This is our compass. This is the way that it tells us to go. This is the plumb line by which we, we judge everything according to. So these are the times that we're living in. And so with this understanding, how much more so do you and I need to raise our voice in this generation? How much more so do we need to be a John the Baptist in this generation? How much more so do we need to be calling people back to biblical morality, to biblical righteousness, to say, no, that's not the way. I'm sorry, this is the way. This is the way. Jesus uh, is the way. Come on, Esther, she understood the times that she was living in, and she chose to do something about it. She stepped up in boldness, and she did something about it. And I just wonder if there's any Esthers in here today. I just wonder if there's any men and women in here today who are not afraid to stand up in boldness. I just wonder if there's any 
anybody in here today who understand the signs of our times and you say, you know what, I got to do something about it, Pastor Rick. The time is running out. We have to do something about it. We cannot lay by idly any longer, you guys. We cannot be apathetic about this stuff any longer. We have to be a voice of truth in this generation. And I fear for our generations if you and I keep silent. I really do. If we keep silent, I fear. So I read this article by the Luzan movement. It was a movement started by Billy Graham of Evangelists. This was one of their meetings. And listen to this. He says, the task before you is to respond courageously to the challenges of your generation. We have heard from great people like Billy Graham and John Stott who have been praying for us throughout this week and for months preceding our gathering. You can't fulfill the, God, the purposes of God in their generation. You can't fulfill the purposes of God in my generation. You will not be able to fulfill the purposes of God in your children's generation, but you can be used greatly in your generation here and now. He says, perhaps it will be written of you, they were the greatest generation, that they were used more greatly and more effectively than any previous generation for the glory of God and for the advancement of his kingdom. We need to understand the signs of the times that we are living in. But you need to know that you can do it. You need to know that, yes, you can be a voice in this generation. You need to know that God has predestined you to be here right now in this generation for such a time as this. Point number two is this. Once we've done that, now we need to begin to confront. So we need to raise our voice of confrontation. When I say that word, a lot of you just get these butterflies in your stomach. I hate confrontation. Guess what? I do too. But it's something that we have to deal with. Esther confronted the king. And she said in verse 16, after she did that, she said, after she, after she said this, she said, if I perish, I perish. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego confronted the king. And he, they said the same thing. If we perish, we perish. In fact, throw us on in, dude. Right? We need to have a voice of confrontation. She had to not only confront the fear that was on the inside of her, but she had to confront the king even though her life depended upon it. You see, if we're going to make an impact in this generation, we cannot be afraid to confront. You cannot be a coward in the face of confrontation. We need to be a people who confront. Right? If we want to see lasting change, is it easy? No. Does it suck? Absolutely it does. Can it be done wrong? It, it, yes, it can be done very wrong. But when it's done right, I'm telling you guys, it is freeing, it is beautiful, it is liberating to both people, and you are better off because of it. But you know what? Before we can confront other things, we need to confront ourselves. It's got to start with us first. It really does. Some of us have things on the inside of us that we don't want to confront. We have mindsets. We have sin, we have trauma, we have hurt, we have addictions, and so on and so forth. And we don't confront them because we're afraid. And in fact, last week, we did some confrontation in some tables in our own life that we flipped over. But I'm convinced that there's still some people in there that need to confront some sin in your life. I really am. Because Monday morning came around and you were right back in it. And this is your warning today. Today's the day that God is saying you need to confront this thing right here, right now. It starts with the body of Christ. It starts with my people. How can we call people into holiness if we're not living in holiness ourselves? How can we call people into righteousness if I'm not practicing righteousness myself? How can I be a voice to this generation if I'm being a hypocrite behind the scenes? Right? We need to confront ourselves. And so we have mindsets that we need to confront, old mindsets that we're stuck in, right? The, again, trauma. Some of us have hurts and trauma on the inside of us that we are afraid to dig up because I don't want to feel those feelings anymore. In fact, I feel safe and secure just stuffing it down right now because nobody can hurt me anymore and I keep it stuffed down, but I wonder why my life is a wreck and I wonder why I keep going around the same circle in the same mount over and over again. Come on, today it stops. It stops. And so you say, Pastor Rick, how do I confront those things in my life? And, well, I would tell you that the first thing you need to do is ask the Holy Spirit for help. He's your helper, right? So we ask him for help. We ask him to reveal these things. We ask him to, to, to bring people around us that's going to help us. And then we need to admit that we have a problem. Okay, taking you back to AA, right? You have to admit that you have a problem. I told you you're getting prison Rick up here, you guys, okay? That's all I know is some of these things. And then we need to confess those to a trusted Christian friend and to a mentor. 
And then we need to ask them to hold us accountable. We need to put in the hard work. Okay? If, if you're pornography, guess what? Put those devices away. Right? If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it out. I pluck it out, right? That's what it's talking about. So there is some hard work, right? Well, I have a drinking problem. Well, why do you keep going into bars and why do you keep going into the liquor store? Okay? Do the hard work to not do those things. And I tell you, if you lean on the Holy Spirit, you will see deliverance and you will see breakthrough in your life. So confrontation can be your best friend. Pastor Aaron always says this in our meetings. And I'm always like, I don't want that friend in my life. Okay? <laughs> I don't like that friend. He makes me feel funky. Makes me scared. But confrontation can be your best friend if you let it. Jesus, he was very confrontational in everywhere he went. I mean, just in the book of John alone, in the 21 chapters, he had a dispute with someone or something that he had to confront in every single chapter. He confronted religion. He confronted the devil. He confronted demons. He confronted sin. He confronted sickness. He confronted uh, disease. He confronted his disciples. He confronted total strangers. Come on, some of you need to confront the sickness in your body today. Today is the day. You need to tell that sickness to go. You need to tell that sickness to stop. Come on, we need to get some unction on the inside of us, man, with these things that are happening to our bodies, with some things that are happening happening to our minds. We need to get a little bit of Holy Spirit unction on the inside of us and begin to confront those things. I mean, he called the apostle Peter Satan to his face. This is Peter, man. This is my roll dog, right? Hey, Peter, on this rock, I'll build my church, man. I'm going to, you know, you know, you're not Cephas anymore. You're Peter. You know what I mean? It's like he is his roll dog. And he turned around and he said, get behind me, Satan. For you do not know what manner of spirit you are from. You say, well, that's pretty, pretty mean, Pastor Rick. No, he did in love. And he told Peter exactly what he needed to hear because Peter was a hard man and he needed to hear that. And so confrontation in love is the key. If you need to confront somebody or a situation, love is the key, okay? Peace is what's gonna hold everything together. It's the binder in that whole scenario. And every time you do it, restoration is your number one outcome. It's your desired outcome, right? We come in love, we come in peace, and we want restoration, and if we do that, when we confront people, even ourselves, I'm telling you, there, 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 there will be a prince of peace that is present in that meeting, in that confrontation, and you will be better off because of it. John Stuart Mill says this. He said, for evil to succeed, all it needs is for good men to do nothing. That's it. In order for evil to succeed in our land, just let the Christians have their, their time in their church. Let them have their coffee and their cool programs and their awesome worship music. But don't, you don't need to do anything outside these four walls. Just keep it in here. Right? So for evil to succeed, all it needs is good men to do nothing. Every time evil rises up in the land, what does God do? He always raises up a voice. Every time evil rises in the land, he always raises up a voice to call people back to the plumb line, to call them back to righteousness, to call them back to holiness. And I heard Jonathan Kahn say the other day in an interview he was doing that if we're living in the days of the Ahabs and we're living in the days of the Elijahs, or, 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 of the Jezebels, then surely we are living in the days of the Elijahs. That surely we're living in the days where voices can be spoken, where there's somebody, a voice crying out, come back to the plumb line, then surely we are. Come on, God always raises up a voice. He always raises up a remnant. He always raises up the Deborahs. He always raises up the Noahs. He always raises up the Gideons. He always raises up the Samsons. He always raises up the Elishas and the Elishas. He always raises up a voice and a remnant. Let me just ask you today, will you be that voice? Is there somebody in here who would say, yes, Pastor Rick, that is me. I want to be that voice. Just like John the Baptist, I want to be the voice crying out in the wilderness. Stop letting the enemy silence you. You have a voice for a reason. Use it. Use it to speak boldness and life. Use it to speak over your household. Men in this, in this room that have wives and children, are you using your voice to speak life over your home and praying and, and pleading the blood and all those other things? Or are you just using it to tear down? Men, we have a responsibility to be that voice in our homes. I like Joe out on the keys, that'd be awesome. Well, I remember early on in my prison sentence, I was in a prison in Canyon City, and uh, there was this big gang member, big guy. You know, he had bald head and tatted up face, and, you know, real scary dude. And so he wasn't only a member, he was actually a leader of these gangs. And he was on the end of his sentence, you know, um, and he walked by my cell, and I heard the Holy Spirit say, go tell him about me. 
I was like, oh. <sighs> you know, <laughs> just wanted to eat my fist. And I'm imagining myself, man, maybe I'll just kill over on the floor and die right now. I don't know. Like, this is, but you know, you've, have you been there, right? Where God tells you to do something and you just, you have 10 different things in your mind that tell you not to do it. And you got this fear in the inside of you and you're like, I don't want to do it, God. You know, but you got to face that fear. You got to confront that thing. And I'm like, God, you don't know who this guy is. He's like, I know who he is. <laughs> like, I can't just go to him. Like, I got to go to his guys. And then his guys goes to him. Like, I just, I don't have that access. He goes, just go knock on his door. And so I rose up in boldness. I grabbed my Bible and I'm like, dang it, man. <laughs> and I'm facing my cell, you know, and like, I just, oh, okay. I walk out the door and I go down and I just knock and he goes, who is it? You know, hey, it's Rick. <laughs> you know, just kind of. <laughs> Have you heard about my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? No, I didn't say that. (laughs) I didn't say that. But I just said, I said, hey, I heard you're getting out in a few days, man. And he goes, oh, yeah. And I'm like, like, awesome, man. Well, can I tell you that God loves you? And, you know, I want to pray for you before you go and speak a blessing over you and just tell you, man, that Jesus cares for you. And he started talking about his grandma who was a praying grandma and all this stuff. And I'm just like, you know, it was just one of those things where, like, I didn't go for the kill. Like, it wasn't like I was like, you got to commit your life right now, dude. You're going to, you know. But like I was obedient. And I faced the fear that was on the inside of me. I don't know what happened to that guy. I mean, I'm praying and hoping that he gave his life to Christ and that he, you know, uh, he didn't go out to the street and die and, you know, do those things, right? But man, it's, it's about being obedient to what he's telling us to do. We have to face ourselves and confront the fear that's on the inside of us. And we have to be men and women who are not afraid to raise our voice in confrontation. We have to be we have to be. You see, we think that courage is the absence of fear, but it's not. It's not the absence of fear. See, courage is being able to do the hard thing despite the fear. Courageous people aren't just courageous and don't fear on the inside. They they got some fear. You think when those soldiers stormed the beaches of Normandy that they were fearless? They weren't, but they were courageous, and they knew what they had to do. They knew their assignment. You and I need to know our assignment. You know what? You have what it takes to be bold. Somebody needs to hear this. You have what it takes to be bold. You have what it takes to be courageous. You have what it takes because the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead, the same spirit that was within in him on the, in the garden of Gethsemane when he was praying sweats of drops of blood, the same spirit was in him that led him to the cross, that he was able to go through the excruciating torture that he went through. That same spirit, guess what, is on the inside of every single one of you. His name is the Holy Spirit. And in him, we have the boldness, and in him, we have the courage. So what are you going to do? We're going to raise our voice in confrontation. The third thing we're going to do, point number three, is this, that we need to raise our voice of prayer and fasting. You need to raise your voice of prayer and fasting. Let me just say this, that you cannot have fasting without prayer. The two go hand in hand. It's like breathing in and breathing out, right? They understood this back in the Old Testament times, and fasting has kind of got away from us in New Testament time, in in, in the day that we live in. But it's like breathing out and breathing in. And in verse 16, it said that they held a three-day fast for Esther, everybody in the kingdom, all all the Jews, to strengthen her, to empower her. You know, and you can best believe that they were praying for her as well. They were were coming on behalf of her before Yahweh to say, God, you you have to do this thing. If not, we're going to die. You know, the truth is that we're heading in 2024. And our very own pastors have declared 2024 the year of the pressing, the year of Gethsemane. Your voice, your voice of prayer is going to have to rise next year. Your voice of fasting is going to have to rise next year. It's going to have to, you guys. There's too much at stake. There's too much at stake in this hour we are living in. We just assessed the hour we're living in. And I, was, I, went, I went nice, you guys, on the assessment of what we're living in. That was nice. It's way worse than that. So the voice of prayer and fasting is going to have to rise. You're going to have to get over the hump. Well, I don't want to miss a meal. You're going to have to get over it, man. I don't like missing meals, okay? They know. (laughs) We're going to have to get over it. Too much is at stake. Your marriages are at stake. Your prodigals are at stake. Your kids' lives are at stake. Your businesses, your health, your finances, all of these things are at stake. A generation being lost to this this occult uh, 
woke agenda that's being placed on them can be lost. There's a lot at stake, you guys. There's a lot on the line. And Martin Luther King said this. He said, in the end, we will not remember the words of our enemies, but we will remember the silence of our friends. Silence is still saying something. It means you don't care. And you just let it pass me by. Can I just say that this world needs a church that operates in the power of the Holy Spirit? It does. You need to operate in the power of the Holy Spirit. You have to. Like I said, there's too much on the line. We need men and women who are full of boldness, who are full of courage. We need men and women who are full of prayer, who are not afraid to fast for a week, who are not afraid to to push aside a meal for a day. We need men and women who are not afraid to challenge the status quo in our culture. We need men and women who are not afraid to to raise their voice in the face of the tyranny that we are seeing in today's age, in the face of this state that we live in that is a complete left-leaning liberal state where they kill babies at random here okay we need a voice in this state and in this generation you guys we live here this is where God has placed us for such a time as this so you say pastor Rick I don't know how to pray and fast we'll have some really simple steps for you to follow the first one is this you need to be intentional you need to spend intentional time praying put the phone away lock the kids in the bathroom I don't know (laughs) Right? Or the other way around, lock yourself in the bathroom, put a towel under it, you know. Mama needs five minutes, please. But be intentional. Intentional time far outweighs the amount of time spent. Just be intentional with your time, praying and be intentional with the things you're going to fast. I want to fast for this sin that I keep dealing with in my life. I want to fast for my child who hasn't come to Christ yet. I want to fast for this, right? Be intentional. Second one is keep it simple. Keep it simple. You don't need to be elaborate using vain repetition in many words when you pray. You don't need to pray like Pastor Aaron or myself or or, or Sandy, right? Just keep it simple. God knows your heart. In fact, it says that he understands groanings and, and things that come out of our mouth. I went through a season here not too long ago where I just kept sighing. I didn't know why. But then one time I'm driving to church one Sunday and I just let out this big sigh. It's like, and I heard the Holy Spirit, and I was like, God, why do I keep doing this? He says, Rick, you're letting out groans and pains to me that you don't even understand and recognize. That's the Holy Spirit crying out in you, that there's just this unsettledness in my spirit about the things going on. So keep it simple. You don't need to fast 17 different things, five different ways for 20 different days. Just pick one thing. Keep it simple. There's a saying in the military, and I'm not, I don't do military, I'm not from the military, but it's keep it simple, stupid. Just keep it simple. I'm not going to call you stupid, although I've done that before. Okay? I'm not going to do that, okay? The next one is stay consistent. If you miss a day of prayer, don't miss two. Isn't that easy? If you forget your fasting and you take a bite, just stop. Don't get religious about it. Your life isn't over because you took a bite while you're fasting, <laughs> right? Stay consistent. Pick a goal and stay the course. I'm going to intentionally pray for 10 minutes every single day from this time to that time. And guess what? The enemy is going to come at you. He's going, to come, he's going to come with all kinds of things. But stay consistent. Stay the course. Pick a goal. I'm going to fast for one day, two days, three days. I'm going to fast one meal for five days, whatever it is. Pick a goal and stay consistent. And the last one there is don't get religious about it. We're not practicing religion. It's okay if you slip up. It's okay if you mess up. It's okay. You just get back up and keep going, right? So point number four is this, as I close. We need to raise our voice of confrontation. We need to raise our voice of prayer and fasting. The last one there is we need to raise your voice of the gospel message. See, the book of Esther has a very happy ending. It's a story of redemption. See, Esther, she's a type of Christ, if you will who brings deliverance and redemption to her people. She saved her people in the face of tyranny and evil. She put her life on the line like Christ put his life on the line. And see, after she did this, Haman's plan was exposed to the king and Haman had a gallows that he was gonna hang Mordecai on. Instead, Haman got hung on his own gallows. And then Mordecai got put into the second position that Haman was in. All because one woman said, you know what, I gotta confront this. 
This is not okay in my land. I'm going to stand up and be bold, even if that means I, my life is going to end. And she went in there, she did the thing, and the children of Israel were saved. You see, you and I have a command to go into the world to preach the gospel to all nations. It's the command that Jesus has given us. You say, Pastor Rick, I fear when I, to bring up the gospel to anybody. You know what that is? That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit in your life. Because when the baptism of the Holy Spirit came, what did Peter do? Peter stood up and he spoke the first gospel message in the Bible ever recorded. And it said 3,000 souls were saved at that hour. And so we've been given a command and a charge to speak truth, to speak life, to not be ashamed of it. Can we be, can we be a people who are not concerned about what other people think about us? Can we be a people who risk offending somebody in order for them to hear the message of the gospel? We got to get over the fact that we, we're going to offend somebody. You're going to offend somebody. Somebody's probably offended right now. I know it. You're going to offend somebody. Who cares? If I offend somebody by preaching truth and the gospel message to them, that's not on my hands. That's on them. We need to be a people who risk preaching the gospel, who risk offending people. It's his message that's offensive. It's not you. The gospel message have all, has always been offended. That's why people hate Jesus so much. That's why they've created a God where they can do their own thing. And I, I don't have to be what you created me to be. I can be the opposite gender. I can do this. I can do that. No, it's, it's rebellion. And so the gospel has the power. It's the power of salvation to everyone who believes. You and I are sitting in this room today because of that gospel message. Can we pray? Lord Jesus, I thank you for every person in this room, God. I thank you for this message of courage and boldness, God. And we've already declared, Lord, the year 2024 is going to be the year of releasing voices and all those type of things, God. But I pray for every person right now, God, that you, Holy Spirit, would begin to reveal to us those things that we need to confront in ourselves, those things that we need to confront, God, around us. Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's sin, God. Maybe it's trauma, whatever it is. Lord, you're calling it out right now. So, Holy Spirit, right now, would you just tap on that person's heart right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And God, we cry out for the world around us. Lord, we cry out for the tyranny that's in our land. God, and we repent on, on behalf of what's going on, even in our own town, Loveland, God. So, Lord, would you show us, God? I pray, Lord, for supernatural encounters this week for every person in here. I pray, Father God, for the divine appointments. I pray, Lord, that as we're out and about in the highways, in the byways, God, that you would lead us into uncomfortable situations where we can pray for people, where we can share your, the faith, where we can just say, you know what, Jesus loves you. Can I share my story of redemption with you? So, Lord, put that on our hearts, God. Lord, we only have a few more weeks left in this year. So, God, Holy Spirit, I, I just pray that you would wreck us for these next few weeks that we'd be a people so on fire for you, Jesus, for what's about to come in the new year. Come on, in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Well, I want to give one more invitation. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you can honestly say, Pastor Rick, I don't. If you don't know where you're going to die, go when you die. Then this prayer is for you. The gospel message is that Jesus came he gave up his life for you so that you and I can have access to eternity for the Father. That he paid the penalty of sin once and for all for you. That he took your place on the cross. He took the shame and the punishment uh, for sin upon himself for you. And he nailed it to the cross and he made a way for you to come into the presence of God through his blood to all those who believe. It says if you confess him as Lord and you believe in your heart that God rose him from the dead, it said you're going to be saved. You're going to be saved from eternal separation from God. And that eternal separation is eternal. Eternal. There's no going back. And so is there anybody here and say, yes, Pastor Rick, I want to, I want to make sure that I can be saved. I want to make sure that, 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 I can, that I can ask him into my heart. Is there anybody in here that would say, yes, Pastor Rick, that's me. Just raise your hand right now over this room. Those watching online as well, I believe there's a button you can click. Just let somebody know. Thank you, Jesus. Awesome. Well, God, thank you so much for today. God, would you bless every person in this room? In the mighty and precious name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Well, Pastor Brittany.